morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church. We're glad to see you this morning and look forward to worshiping you with you today. So let's stand and let's sing together thanks and praise. Those of you who have brought an offering with you today, there are containers in the back of the church uh, that you can drop that off. Thank you so much for continuing to finance this ministry here in South Haven and the surrounding area. After our worship service today, we'll have a very brief uh, congregational meeting because I just have to share a bunch of good things that are going on here with you. Uh, we're not voting on anything. We don't need a consensus, but you might want to know some of the neat things that is going on now. Uh, during prayer time, make sure that you keep in mind Nolan, Anna, and Caroline, uh, the individual that we've been praying for from YDC. Uh, his name's Tom. He's home from rehab and uh, doing better. We rejoice that Roberta is here today. And also during prayer time, please uh, keep in mind Deb Jenks, who's just going through some issues with her medication. So let's pray that they get that all straightened out. And by the way, tomorrow is Dan and Tracy's 18th wedding anniversary. So, 
Father, we give you thanks and praise for this opportunity to worship you this morning. Meet with us in a very special way. Open up our eyes to see Jesus as we have never seen him before. And Father, we pray that your spirit will write the truths from your word on our hearts so that we might serve you with every fiber of our being. May all that is done in this service be for the honor and glory of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let's continue singing and worshiping by joining together who you say I am.
All right, take a moment, turn to your neighbors this morning, greet them in the Lord today. Two, three, I will So it's just really hard for me not to feel really glad when I sing that song. So we'll give you an opportunity to share a few words praising God and why he has made you glad. I will start out because I, I guess I can. And I know it sounds kind of weird. This is nothing overly spiritual, but I always like looking for ways that God subtly chooses to bless me where I just didn't expect. So the neighbor to my north of our house had her driveway resurfaced. And I, she's got a big driveway and stuff like that, so the people that were resurfacing that are parking out the road in front of my house and everything else like that. They get all done, and some skinny dude comes over to my house, and he said... We have some leftover asphalt. Do you mind if we put it down here at the end of your driveway? I'm thinking, how much is this going to cost me? You know, because nothing in this world is free. And I'm hemming and hawing, and he goes, it won't cost you anything. <laughs> and I said, let me think about it. Yes! So they came with a skid steer, dug it up, moved all that stuff aside, 
came and laid that down, and at the end of my driveway, I got this cool thing that's no longer dirty, muddy, rocky, and it's going to be real easy for me to shovel. So thank you, Lord, for your blessings in mysterious ways. How about you? How has God made you glad? Yes, he is. And you are here. And they weren't going to schedule surgery till September, right? Wow. Well, I think that they said that they broke up the stones and got rid of those. So you didn't need surgery. They let me stay overnight uh, in a beautiful room. The first night was sort of rough, but uh, I just stayed overnight, came home the next day. And yeah. uh, I can, uh, it's a great hospital. It's so big, Bronson. I can't believe how big it is and all the employees that are working there. And you know, they are so good. I never had one person that I can't say just gave full force all the time. Twelve hour shifts are long. But it was it's crazy. Great. I mean, I'm not wanting to go back, you know, but uh, it was great. <laughs> I really hope not, you know. You've been there enough this year. Anyone else? You just can't see me back here. But anyway, that really cute drummer up there, I'm really excited that uh, we have 18 years together tomorrow, married. Um, and our oldest, Riley, just turned 14, which Ooh. just kind of blows my mind. So right. yeah, I'm thankful for all those He's things. He's got a smile on his face. <laughs> cool. Just a really quick, I am blessed by living in South Haven. Uh, this week we were blessed three times by wonderful music, just kind of spur of the moment, going someplace, and there being live music, and it was all wonderful. And I sometimes forget how wonderful the place we live in right. is. What's always amusing to me is it's a good vacation spot for people who pay good money to come and visit and local. <laughs> you know. Anyone else? Okay, let's stand and continue our worship by singing together, Worthy, Worthy.
this morning. So uh, Doug just stopped by and told me that Stan and Gene left. They, Stan wasn't feeling good. So I don't know what, what the deal is, but let's pray for Stan. Father, we just pray for your hand upon Stan as apparently he's not feeling too well. Pray, Father, that whatever he is facing, you'll help him recover quickly. We just thank you for them. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, I would like us to once again look at the very first psalm because I have not had the opportunity to finish addressing everything that is in it. We covered it for the last couple weeks. But what I'd like to talk about today focuses on the subject, I guess you would say, of prosperity, fruitful prosperity to be exact. Uh, so let's review this before we look at the last three verses of this psalm so we have an idea of what it's saying in its entirety. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Now, two weeks ago, I had mentioned how this song talks about two kinds of individuals in the world. When you get down to the most basic things that really matter, there's only two kinds of people. There are those who are in the kingdom of God, and there are those who are on the outside looking in. Now, you cannot be in both. You are one or the other. From the psalm, we saw that a person, whether it is a man or a woman, is blessed if they avoid three pitfalls. They avoid walking in the counsel of the wicked, standing in the way of sinners, and sitting in the seat of mockers. And the way that we can avoid these three pitfalls so that we can have the favor of God poured out upon us is to delight in the law of the Lord and to meditate on his word day and night. Now, I'm not going to elaborate anymore. Uh, look on Facebook over the last couple of weeks if you need to have that expanded upon. From this twofold instruction, this the psalmist shows us 
the result of what will happen if our delight is truly in God and if we meditate on his word, if we live it out day by day. He says, he is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. I don't know if you ever heard of a guy named Chuck Swindoll, but he comments on this verse, and he states he's impressed by the fact that in this verse here, it talks about not something that we do, it's something that we will be like. What shall we be like? We will become tree-like. Tree-like. The older I get, the more I uh, have an appreciation for trees. Uh, I love watching them grow. Back in 2006, I planted 80 Norway spruce on my property. Uh, maybe if you were here in 2006 on Easter Sunday, uh, at, at the end of the service, we gave away uh, over 100 little uh, Norway spruce seedlings. Maybe some of you still have one growing on your property. Uh, so, But I bought a sapling, which was like another year o older, and... So my youngest son and I planted those. Um, about, a, about a month ago, I went to my uh, second oldest son's father-in-law and I purchased four pollinating trees, which means they have flowers and they are very bee-friendly. You know, we want to be sensitive because we kind of need bees to pollinate, whether it's for blueberries or strawberries or whatever else like that. And uh, I'm going to benefit from seeing the flowers when they come in bloom, and the bees will benefit from the flowers as well. The psalmist states that we will be like a tree planted. We'll be like a tree. In other words, this is a word picture that is used to describe those that are righteous, those whom God chooses to pour his favor on the blessed ones. Now, this could be a reference to a tree whose location just happens to be near a stream of water, but it can also refer to a tree that has been purposely planted alongside a stream. Now, in Hebrew, the verb that's, the verb that's translated planted actually means to transplant, not merely plant. And that understanding is, is rich insignificant to say the least. On the one hand, to plant simply means to cause to take root or to become firmly established for the purpose of stability, nutrition, food or water, growth, and eventually production. So if I take an acorn and I dig a hole and I put it in there, I have planted a tree. On the other hand, to transplant includes not only planting the tree. It also includes taking the plant out of one environment and placing it into another that is more conducive to production or growth or stability. I've transplanted a number of trees in my yard. For example, while mowing my lawn one day, I had noticed that there's this little red maple growing underneath uh, a whole ton of Norway spruce. I thought, well, that's not going to be good. Now, I didn't plant it there. You know, I didn't, it must have grown from a, a seed that got there somewhere. But I thought, this is never going to grow because the other trees are just going to dwarf that. So I went over and I dug it up and I transplanted it to a place that's where it can grow as large as it, it possibly can grow. It has better conditions. In general, trees don't get to choose where they'll grow, do they? They're subject to so many different factors. Nature, the wild, elements, various animals also play a major role in getting a seed to germinate. Now, from the context of this psalm, it appears that the tree in view has been purposefully and strategically transplanted to a good water source. I have a swamp on the back of my property. The area is always, always wet. And I have watched the trees 
that were one time alive in the swamp area slowly die because of the excessive moisture that's in the ground. It gets rotten. There they go. Because that area is so wet, I chose to plant some weeping willows there uh, for a number of reasons. Number one, if I didn't plant them there, I have a great view of the highway. And I'd rather look at the trees than I'd rather look at the highway. The second reason I planted them there is weeping willows love water. And I'm thinking, great, suck that up. Get rid of the water, you know. Uh, so what I did is I took and I rooted some, some cuttings. And, and when their roots seemed to be pretty healthy, then I transferred them to a, a pot and then the following year, I chose to take those and transplant them by my swamp because willows love water. Now, according to the psalm, the righteous are planted, or better, transplanted by streams of water. Who do you think does the transplanting? Say God. God does, yes. So when a person surrenders his or her life to God and becomes a follower of him, then Jesus takes and transplants that individual from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Jesus takes that person out of an environment that will utterly lead to death and transplant that person to a place where his or her roots can grow deep and strong and healthy. So a person who delights in the law of the Lord, who meditates on his word day and night, is like a tree planted by streams of water. In a literal sense, in this psalm, um, streams of water is probably an artificial irrigation channel which would have provided a continuous source of water for the tree. Irrigation was not a foreign concept to those individuals in biblical times. From the beginning of time, water has been so essential for life, for you and I as human beings, for animals, for agriculture. Civilizations flourish around good water sources. And so likewise, the righteous will also grow and flourish when they are transplanted near a good, good water source. It's my understanding that the roots of a tree absorb water and minerals through a structure called root hairs. And taken in from the roots, minerals and water is carried up through the wood cells to the leaves. Now, as effective as a root system is to the life of a tree, roots will have a difficult time securing water from the ground if there is no water present. Under normal conditions, trees that have a good water source will fare much better than trees that do not. Now, the righteous will not have to worry about a good water source. Because we see, according to this psalm, that not only will Jesus transplant us to a place where our roots can grow deep and strong and healthy, he will transplant us in a place where there is life-giving water and nutrients. Jesus is the source of that living water. In our study on worship, if you recall, Jesus has this encounter with a Samaritan woman and he tells this Samaritan woman, whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So the Lord takes and he transplants us by streams of living water where we just get to soak it in. And why not? Those who are transplanted delight in the law of the Lord. We meditate on his word day and night, drawing from him, drawing from that spring of water, life and nutrients through Jesus himself. I love this word picture. A person whose delight is in the law of the Lord who meditates 
on his word day and night is like a tree planted by streams of water. Now, what do you think about when you think about trees? When I think of trees, I think of a number of different things. I think of strength and stability. One of the reasons why trees are so strong and stable is because of, of sprawling anchors called roots. And it's hard for a tree to be uprooted if it has strong and deep roots. Not all trees do. In many plants, the primary root is called a taproot. This is usually the first root that's formed during germination of the seed. Now, other roots grow off of that tap root. They're called secondary roots. But because it is larger than the secondary roots, the tap root penetrates deep, far deep into the soil. So using this analogy, let me ask you a question. How deep is your tap root? How deep do your roots run? God has transplanted us near streams of water so that our roots may grow strong and deep. So when the strong word, uh, winds of adversity blow, and they will blow, you will remain anchored and secure. When I think of a tree, I think of the beauty especially during the autumn months, right? I mean, I know I'm not the only one who loves trees in the autumn. Many people drive along the countryside in the fall looking at the beautiful colors that are all around from the leaves of deciduous trees. As far as trees are concerned, leaves are important. For one of their principal functions is, is the manufacturing of sugar by the process of photosynthesis. You're learning all sorts of things about trees, right? Some of the newly formed sugars is used by the leaf cell for energy, but most is carried to other parts to provide energy for growth and for development in other areas. Water is necessary to prevent overheating and the wilting of leaves. Because water is lost through the leaves, water that enters the roots is pulled upward to replace that lost moisture, therefore ensuring a constant circulation throughout the tissue of a tree. Without a good water source, the leaves of a tree can easily wither and die. Have you ever noticed that some trees... Some leaves on the tree seem to wither easier than others, quicker than others. I don't know about you, but in the autumn when I drive around and I want to see all the beautiful color that's around here, I don't go looking for trees that are withered and dead. Do you? I mean, I want to drive around and look at trees that are just alive and blazing with color. And when I find a patch of those trees, the beauty is sometimes so overwhelming it can take your breath away. The only thing I regret about autumn is that the color of the leaves don't last longer. Too short. However, as far as the analogy in this psalm is concerned, do you realize that your leaves will not wither. They'll not wither. If you find that your leaves are in danger of withering, I have a solution for you. You need to draw water and nutrients from the streams of water where you are transplanted. What do your leaves look like? When I think of trees, I think of the many different purposes of a tree. Trees produce lumber for building purposes. If we didn't have lumber for building purposes, John would have to find another job. Jason would have to find another job. We use trees in the manufacturing of paper products, paper goods. We use trees for shade and for shelter. And yes, we even use trees for food. Some trees produce fruit. As you know, fruit often varies in physical appearance, but 
The basic structure of fruit is the same. They're developed from the ovaries of flowers through a number of processes beginning with pollination. That's why I decided to plant four pollinating trees. I want to track the bees. Pollination is important. While we enjoy eating many different kinds of few, uh, fruits, besides being a source of nourishment and enjoyment, the fruit of the tree is important because it allows those trees, the seeds of those trees, to be dispersed so that reproduction can take place. So that other fruit trees may grow and bear fruit themselves. Just as there are many different kinds of fruit, there are many different kinds of spiritual gifts given to followers of Jesus. And while these gifts may vary in, in form and physical appearance, their basic structure is the same. They're all given by God the Holy Spirit. Are your gifts being used for the kingdom? The one who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked is a blessed man. The one who does not sit in the seat of mockers is a blessed man. The one whose delight is in the law of the Lord is a blessed man. The one who meditates day and night on the word God pours his favor upon. Those individuals are like a tree transplanted by streams of water. It yields its fruit and its leaf does not wither. I'm excited about it. Not only will the blessed person bear fruit, the psalmist says, whatever he does prospers. Now that should catch your attention, don't you think? I mean, I want to be prosperous. Don't you want to be prosperous? Literally, this sentence could be translated in this fashion. Well, let me just say, prosperous means to accomplish satisfactorily what is intended to succeed. And what should succeed is the bearing of fruit, prosperous, not by world standards. That means we might not be wealthy. We might not be financially prosperous. We are prosperous according to God's view of prosperity. Because, again, the root means to accomplish satisfactorily what is intended or to succeed. What does a tree do, a fruit tree do? fruit tree produces fruit. And because there is mention of fruit in the psalm, the tree that is being referred to obviously is a fruit tree, and the fruit tree should bear fruit. Therefore, it prospers, right, when it bears fruit. For example, a peach tree prospers when it grows to maturity and produces what? Peaches. A shade tree prospers when it grows tall and strong and produces shade. Each tree prospers when it does what it was created to do. Now there's a disclaimer in this text. And the disclaimer is that fruit trees will bear their fruit in their season. In other words, it doesn't happen overnight. When I planted those trees in 2006, they didn't grow 30 feet tall overnight. This is important for us to understand. Just as water does not produce instantaneous growth or fruit in a tree, so the Word of God does not immediately bring us fully to maturity. It takes time. God has ordained this to be a process that takes time. And for each individual, that time span varies. It's up to Jesus. He is the one who said, you didn't choose me, I chose you and appointed you to go bear fruit, fruit that will last according to my timetable. You see what he's saying? What he's saying is you didn't transplant yourselves by streams of water. I did that for you. I provided everything that you need. I provided water, nutrients, sunlight, so that you can bear fruit. And by the way, you will bear fruit 
and you will bear fruit that lasts. A righteous person who abides in God and God in him prospers by growing to maturity, by becoming what God intended him or her to be, and by producing spiritual fruit for the glory of God. That is what he has ordained for us. Each Christian has his or her own timetable for growth, for productivity. Let's not expect everyone else to be on our time schedule, same as we are. Our responsibility is to delight in the Lord and meditate on his word day and night. Because when we do, fruit will come. Fruit will come. Now, before we can conclude our discussion on Psalm 1, we have to look at the flip side of the coin. In contrast to the state and character of the righteous stands the character and the state of those who are called the wicked. In verse 4, we read, Not so the wicked. They're like chaff that the wind blows away. I mean, the word picture here describes what happens when you sift grain during biblical times. We, we do it differently today. But David wasn't around today. He wrote according to the circumstances of his time and culture. So at harvest time, they took the grain and they would take it and they would toss it in the air in order to separate the grain from the husks or the straw, the chaff. The wheat would then uh, fall to the ground because the wind blows away the chaff and the grain is then take, taken from the threshing floor and gathered. So unlike the righteous, God will not pour out his favor on the wicked. The context tells us this very plainly. It says the wicked kind of will not be like a tree planted by streams of water. They will not yield fruit in and out of season. Their leaves will wither, and they will not prosper. And then the psalmist continues to explain the state and character of the wicked in verse 5. They'll not be able to avoid judgment. The psalmist says, Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. In other words, he's saying that the wicked will get their due they will not be able to stand in the judgment. The idea here in this context has to do with the ability of withstanding God's judgment. They're not going to be able to stand in, against his judgment. They don't have the ability. Unbelievers will face God at the great white throne judgment, but they're not going to be able to stand the test. They'll face condemnation. To avoid final judgment, one must have received the righteousness of Christ. One can only receive this righteousness as a result of having a saving relationship with Jesus. As Romans 8.1 states, he says, Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Only those individuals whose names are written in the book of life will bypass standing before God's judgment throne. The wicked will not be able to stand that test. To clarify it further, the psalmist states that the wicked, here called sinners, will not be included in the assembly of the righteous. And the idea here behind this phrase, assembly of the righteous, is similar to what we looked at uh, un, with the phrase, sit in the seat of mockers in verse 1. The idea here is to be regarded as being a part of that assembly, being counted as one of them. In other words, sinners will never be considered in the same camp as the righteous. There'll be a time of separation, just like chaff is separated from wheat. The wicked will not be found in community with the righteous. And finally, unlike the righteous prospering in whatever they do, the end result of the wicked is tragic. They will perish. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. I love this song. 
I love the imagery. I love the promises. I love the truths in this psalm. Because if you are in Christ Jesus, you have an opportunity to rejoice and give thanks because you are highly favored with God. You are blessed. So you should grow, mature, bear fruit for the glory of God. And if you are not in Jesus, well, you can take care of that right now by calling on his name for salvation. You have that opportunity right now to humble yourself before his lordship and receive forgiveness of sin and everlasting life with him. The choice is yours. And if you do, he will take and he will transplant you out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light and transplant you by streams of living water so that you can grow and mature and bear fruit for his glory. Let's give thanks for what Christ has done for us. Keep in mind those that we continue to pray for healing, Nolan, Anna, Caroline, Tom, Stan. Give thanks for Roberta. Pray for Deb Jenks. Let's pray as the Spirit leads, shall we?
Before we're dismissed, let's stand and unite our voices together, giving praise to God by singing our God. is greater than our God. Listen, we're going to start our business meeting in about five minutes, ten minutes. Um, that way you can take care of any personal needs that you may have. And if you're not able to stay well, then God bless you. You're dismissed. Go live out your faith. <laughs>